Hello, my name's Alice Gray and welcome back to another episode of Inside the Petri Dish, the podcast that dissects science and takes a look down the microscope at controversial topics within research. I've been set the task to find out more about climate change by Tay and Vicky. So in this episode, I had a chat with a marine biologist about his work and the effects of climate change on seagrass and how seagrass is one of our main protectors in defending our planet against climate change. You could say that the grass is always greener on the other side, in the other, in the sea, under the sea. Never mind, just listen to the interview. I'm joined by Benjamin Jones, a marine biologist and founding director of Project Seagrass. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So... In this section of Inside the Petri Dish, we're looking at climate change and conservation. And climate change has quite clear impacts on wildlife, ecosystems, and therefore conservation plays a huge role in maintaining the planet as we know it. So can you tell us a little bit about your work? So my research primarily focuses on seagrass meadows, which are underwater gardens that span uh, the, the earth, but they're incredibly threatened and so my work primarily focuses on understanding the drivers of these threats and how, how important these meadows are for um, fisheries, food security, livelihoods and the planet in general. As I said, in this series of Inside the Petri Dish, we're investigating the effects of climate change and the consequences of not looking at how we use fossil fuels and the consequences of that on our planet. And so what are the consequences of the environmental changes associated with climate change? If we want to talk about seagrasses, um, seagrass meadows need shallow, sheltered waters to survive. And one of the key, key threats of climate change is sea level rise. And with sea level rise, it would mean that the area that in which seagrasses grow will change. And this might result in a lot of seagrass loss. And to be honest, we simply we don't really understand a huge amount of you know what will happen to seagrass meadows and there, there's been some interesting studies that show um, how um, ocean acidification actually might benefit seagrass meadows um, so that seagrass meadows will absorb more carbon from the water column under acidic seas so at the same time while seagrass meadows might be affected by climate change there might be also our, our, one of our biggest saviors in the fact that if um, we do have more acidic oceans, those seagrass meadows are actually mitigating the, the effects of climate change for neighbouring coral, coral reefs. And so even though there may be some losses you know, within ecosystems across yeah. the planet, some yeah. organisms and animals will thrive because, I mean... Potentially, potentially. Potentially, because if you think about the history of the planet, it's never stayed the same. Yeah. And life is still here <laughs> and um, so we should never underestimate the ability for animals and organisms from bacteria to large big fluffy polar bears yeah. to cope but then also this is the result of us. There has been a lot of controversy around climate change and its actual existence I guess. Yes, yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well I'm, I'm you know I've fully fully believe that humans have caused this rapid climate change that we're seeing and it's it's sad because seagrass meadows are so 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 good at at kind of mitigating the effects of climate change they they absorb up to 35 times more carbon um, than the rainforests do per hectare um, and the irony in this is that um, some of the the drivers of climate change, such as animal agriculture, are actually seagrass's biggest threat. So one of the largest drivers of climate change, animal agriculture, is actually driving the loss of one of our climate change mitigators. How, how is that happening? Seagrasses need, um, need light to photosynthesize and, and uh, produce food, but um, the, coastal, the coastal environment is under huge stress globally. Um, and this is primarily due to uh, an inflow of nutrient-rich water, um, which causes eutrophication, and tiny microscopic algae um, called epiphytes grow on the surface of leaves, and that actually reduces the plant's, uh, plant's ability to um, capture sunlight. Um, and of course, with uh, agriculture, deforestation, we're getting a huge 
um, runoff of nutrient-rich water that is flooding into coastal um, environments and you know killing killing seagrass. That's really interesting because when you think of um, deforestation, you think of oh no, we're losing this orangutans. Yeah, and, yeah, but. I suppose it's part of the issue with the oceans in the fact that they're they are underwater they're not visible yeah and people tend to look over that you know they yeah they're, they're invisible to to us so that we don't really we don't really care about what goes on yeah. in them and that's I suppose even like when you look at plastics and stuff it's it's only after blue planet I don't you know show the world that plastics are causing harm to whales and now everyone's like oh okay Right, well, let's do something about yeah. it. Um, so it takes that to... Uh, yeah, I was just about to say about Blue Planet and how programmes like Blue Planet open up a whole other world that we don't even ne- consciously think about every day. No. And as long as they are getting the discussions going, it's great, but it, it takes that human aspect for humans to actually care about mm. the products they're using yeah. and how that could impact on the environment. So why don't you tell us a bit about Project Seagrass then? Ah, so Project Seagrass was basically born out of a, a passion for seagrass in, in that it is this unknown, kind of totally unacknowledged um, habitat that people don't know about. Um, and uh, in I think it was 2013, I was finishing off my master's and I'd been around the UK to collect some seagrass samples and um, and I was just kind of blown away about how little people even knew what, knew about seagrass. And um, myself, uh, my supervisor at the time and another student, we, we all came together to, to try and make a stand and I suppose that's where Project Seagrass Origins seedlings <laughs> uh, began oh good pun there <laughs> uh, but yeah i mean it's project seagrass is is basically a tool for for um advancing the conservation of seagrasses through through public engagement and impact so when we're talking about climate change and the effect on ecosystems how important is the role of conservation in combating that uh, well uh is that a really complicated, huge question? <laughs> it, it is, but it's, it's quite simple in the fact that uh, conservation needs humans, but humans need the environment. So it, it is this social, ecological system that we're, we're working towards. And, and conservation is, in the past, it's, it's, it's kind of neglected the social element of conservation. And I think this is now changing and there's more emphasis on um, how, how important people are, are for conservation. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that we'll see more so as, as climate change becomes a bigger topic. Um, well, it is a huge topic, I mean, but I think it will be acknowledged more that you know, people are some, somewhat key to, to conservation um, in general. Yeah, and not just scientists. Not just scientists, no. I mean... There's, we know so little about the, the marine environment specifically, um, and people are key to, to kind of harnessing that knowledge from from the environment. Uh, there's there's fishermen across the world that know where the fish are, know what time of the year to fish, what time of the day, um, where these fish will will aggregate, um, and these are these people, you know, the, the local ecological knowledge and local traditional knowledge are so important to inform how we we zone marine protected areas um, and it's these people that that have that have had this interaction and had this um this close relationship close close, relationship yeah yeah with with nature um that know know it best really um the scientists can go go to a uh a rainforest for example um and see all these things going on, but the tribe that's there, been there for fifty years or even longer, will have much more of a you know a longer term understanding of how things have changed and what's the drivers of these changes, or at least their perceived drivers of change. And that's something that we've been trying to push um, with our work, at least. 
there's definitely a give and take relationship because if you look at communities that benefit from a good coral reef system because they fish in those areas or the coral reef is their economic source then by ruining that coral reef and that economic source then they don't get anything out of it so sustaining something yeah. like a good healthy coral reef system is beneficial for both the environment and them and the community yeah and, and a, a community we work with in indonesia are kind of the perfect example of that it's in the heart of the, the coral triangle and um, their their kind of interaction with the marine environment is so clear they they most of their protein comes from coral reefs and seagrasses um, yet they're in decline they're they're threatened majorly threatened by overfishing um, and while overfishing is the elephant in the room there they also appreciated that their, their seagrasses um, were under threat from sedimentation so we facilitated a, a, a series of workshops that kind of helped them identify that oh okay my, our seagrasses is affected by sedimentation what can we do to to change that and it's spurred this amazing kind of um, initiative that uh, the community were going to plant trees all along their, their riverbanks that they'd, they'd cut down for farmland that um, offered incentives to the farmers and the people who owned land in, in the fruit that they produced but also retained the water in the, in the system so actually the key, the key here is that by planting trees they're actually helping the seagrasses but and it's also a win-win because they're helping with, to retain work, water in the in the ground that they can then use um, as a source of water because um, there's a big problem with, with um, water availability on the, on the island anyway so it's the power of people you know something that needs to be <laughs> acknowledged shouted, for what yeah. it is <laughs> yeah shout it from the rooftops really and I think what's interesting about your work is we often think of big cuddly animals when we talk about conservation like polar bears pandas and those are great but it's also these organisms that we don't think about that are really important in terms of conservation. Yeah, yeah. And just as a final point, really, and it's something that I've noticed on your Twitter, is that you're vegan. And as a (laughs) fellow vegan, I want to know why you turned vegan. Ah, Especially considering your work, really. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can't take all the credit. My my partner turned me vegan. And I, it was, as a marine biologist, I I was always sceptical about eating fish. um, And... And then yeah, my partner kind of opened up my eyes and was like, well, if you, if you care about fish, why, why do you care about everything else? But following on from that, I mean, it's the, the environment, environmental aspects of, of a plant-based diet are my kind of real drivers. I do you know, care about animal welfare and it's, it's, it's progressed as I've, I've uh, I suppose, gone on this path. But my, my kind of real care is... is uh, for the environment and as I mentioned earlier it's <laughs> our biggest our biggest threat to, to climate change is animal agriculture and it's also our biggest threat to one of our biggest threats to, to our our climate heroes seagrass meadows so that's <laughs> what I'm trying to <laughs> get at like give give up reduce your meat yeah even even you know and and you might save some seagrass or at least contribute to saving seagrass and then maybe help mitigate climate change so you know yeah oh put well perfect note to finish with, so <laughs> thank you so much for joining me and thank you for having me uh, i look forward to seeing the results of project seagrass thank you <laughs> so that's it for this episode of inside the petri dish we got to hear some really interesting stuff from benjamin about how a lot of the life that's in places we can't necessarily see it is playing a major role in protecting us from the effects of climate change Next time, we're going to be joined by our final guest before I take my findings and report back to Vicky and Tay. So until next time, see you later.